Okay. Chapter 48, Lights Out. On the way home, Gunny told Mark and Jim that he wanted them to be heads of the scout teams. You know what's wrong? Yeah, I'm kind of irritating. Okay. That's kind of far away from the table, you know. Gunny told Mark and Jim that he wanted them to be the heads of the scout teams. He planned to talk to the security team about. He expected to get the approval today and start training tomorrow. He would promote Ted to take Scott's place on Alpha Shift. Shaparo, now that he wasn't needed to weld and plumb as much, would take Charlie's shift, and Dwight would be in charge of Delta. Mark tried to pay attention to what Gunny was saying, but his mind kept slipping back to the Craig and Connie situation. He didn't know what to do. On one hand, he felt it was none of his business. They were two consenting adults, and they knew what they were doing. However, in the current circumstances, things, things weren't like they were before the burst. Everyone in the community needed to be able to trust everyone else. That meant that, that if Craig was sneaking around with someone else's wife, he wasn't trustworthy. Didn't it also mean if someone knew it was going on and didn't say something, they weren't trustworthy either? Mark thought it did, but that didn't make it make having to tell Joe any easier. Mark knew he wouldn't take the news well. Perhaps if he told Susan first, she would kick Craig out and that would solve the problem. No one else would be willing to put Craig up and he would have to go. That seemed logical and easier. When they got home with the tank, the men unloaded it at Manny's house. Shaparo had already started laying out a stand for the tank to elevate it 10 feet. He just needed the actual measurements of the tank to be able to finalize his plans. David was following the big man around, double-checking his measurements for him and soaking up the knowledge given to him. Manny was helping the men move the water tank to where it would be placed, and when they were through, Mark pulled him off to one side. How are Letty and Robbie? They're doing fine, under the circumstances. And Ronnie? She's still having some trouble accepting things, but she and Letty are getting along well. I think they're helping each other. They almost act like sisters, Manny said. That's good. If there's anything we can do to help them, let me know. Thanks, Mark. I think having the funeral tomorrow will help Letty and Robbie put this tragedy behind them and start to move on with their lives. Too bad we couldn't have done the same thing for Ronnie. Yeah, too bad, Mark agreed. Hey, do you think we could have a memorial service for Ronnie's parents? I think that's a wonderful idea. Why don't you talk to her about it and we'll set it up if she wants. I will, Manny said. Mark grabbed Jim and asked him if he wanted to go see Jerry Watson about the night sights for the rifles. Jim was agreeable and the two men grabbed a quick bite to eat before they left. Mark got some of the silver out of his safe to take with him. When they got to Jerry's house, Jim honked the horn and they waited. No one came out. So they drove down the road to the elder Mr. Watson's house. The gate was closed, which was no surprise, but Mr. Watson's new suburban was just behind the gate. It looked like it had been used in a movie where the car gets raked over by a machine gun. Jim honked the horn and the men waited. After a few minutes, a group of four armed guards approached the gate. They were rushing from tree to tree, two at a time. When they got close enough, Mark could make out that one of the men was Tony. He didn't recognize the other three. Since Mark and Jim were in the truck, Tony had to get a little closer to recognize them. Mark saw the look on his face relax when he did. He waved to the three men he'd come down with to tell them it was okay, and they pushed the ventilated Suburban to the side. Tony then opened the gate and waved them through. Once they were on the other side, Mark could see there were several men who were stationed at the gate. The Watsons had dug foxholes, not unlike those they had at Silver Hills, but theirs were camouflaged so well they couldn't be seen from the road. Mark thought that it was smart that these men hadn't revealed themselves. Tony came up to the window. Hey, Jim. Hi, Mark. What brings you out to our neck of the woods? Never mind that. What happened here? Your dad's truck looks like Swiss cheese, Jim said. Yeah, we started having a little trouble after the grocery store shut down. Let's go back to the house and I'll tell you all about it. The four men who had come from the house pushed the Suburban back into place and then climbed into the back of Jim's truck. He drove the 300 yards to Mom and Pop Watson's large house. He parked in front of the garage, which had been turned into a large dining hall. Mark and Jim saw that it was Tent City behind the house. Jerry, Mr. Watson, and a whole group of men Mark didn't recognize were waiting in the garage with weapons. Tony jumped out of the truck and spoke. It's okay. It's Jim Davis and Mark Turner.
Mark saw the relieved look on everyone's face. Jerry and his dad came up and shook the men's hands. <clears throat> Tony began to explain the events of the past two days, past two weeks, to the friends. Like I said, it started a couple weeks ago. I guess quite a few people know where we live, and they started coming as individuals or in small groups, trying to buy or trade for weapons. Anyway, one guy came up, and we traded him a pistol and a rifle with ammo for an old running Bronco. We kind of wondered why the guy would make such a one-sided deal, but then we found out. Jerry and our cousin Henry took him home, and when they got there, the guy tried to steal the Bronco back. Jerry picked up the story. When we got to his house, he stepped out and pointed a handgun at us. The dumbass had stuck a loaded magazine into the pistol, and he thought it was loaded. Even though he never chambered around, he told Henry and me to get out of the truck and take off. We just laughed at him and drove away. He left the rifle and all the ammo in the truck, and we brought it back home. Anyway, we realized it wasn't a good idea to deal with anyone we didn't know well. It's kind of ironic, really. We bought all these surplus rifles, knowing that one day things would go south, and they'd really be worth something. It finally happened, but now we can't sell them in fear that they might be turned on us. Tony laughed. Mark started to wonder if he had made a mistake trading the SKS to Mr. Schmidt. So as more and more people come to buy guns, came to buy guns, we sent most of them away empty-handed. Some were really pissed and made threats to come back. We put a couple of guys at the gate 24-7. Five guys showed up one day and shot and killed Uncle Frank and our neighbor, Mr. Barnes, while they were watching the gate. We killed three of them, and the other two ran off, wounded, we think. But we decided we had to beef up our security. More and more of the neighbors were staying here, and we put more guys on the gate, where they're hidden and protected now. And we blocked the gate with Dad's Suburban. A few more small groups tried to attack us, but we ran them off easily with the new setup. Then last week, a big group of 16 or 7, 18 guys tried to get in. They shot the truck up, but they weren't able to get in. One of the neighbors got wounded slightly, but no one else on our side even got a scratch. Jerry said, so what are you two doing here? <clears throat> Mostly we're looking for some night sights, Mark said. No problem, said Glock or 1911. Actually, we need them for our rifles. We had a little close encounter the other night, and we couldn't see our sights for squat. But we don't have any for rifles, Tony sounded disappointed. Tony, didn't I see a bunch of AR-15 night sights in the shop a few months ago, Jerry asked. Yeah, but I sent them all back. I had ordered some Glock sights, and they sent those by mistake. I wish I'd kept them now. Any chance you could make some? Jim asked Tony. You're pretty good at that kind of stuff. I might be able to. I'll have to try and see what I can do. What kind of rifles do you want them for? ARs, SKSs, and AKs, Mark answered. I also need to see about buying another SKS if you have any more. We still have a bunch, but we really don't want cash anymore. We'll take silver like we did before, or we could trade for something, Jerry said. What do you need? Tents, cots, building materials, books, batteries, toilet paper, food, and about a million other things. Jerry rolled his eyes. Just like everything else, I suppose. The big item we need is a tractor. We have some cattle, but we need to cut and bale some hay to get them through the winter. I don't suppose you'd have a tractor to trade, though. Not to trade, but maybe we could rent you one. We have an old Ford that belongs to one of our guys. Mark didn't say it was Ralph's. Would that work? How big is it? Medium size, I don't really know that much about them. I think my father-in-law said it was 33 horsepower, Jim added. That's a little on the small side, but we'll make it work, Tony said. The men worked out the details. Mark and Jim left with the replacement SKS. They would bring the tractor over on Friday, and Tony would hopefully have something worked up on the night size. The Watsons would rent the tractor for $10 a day in silver or trade for weapons and ammo or the night size if Tony could make them. On the way home, Jim told Mark he was starting to regret trading a gun for the water tank. Jim agreed that while it was a much better deal for them, it might not have been the smartest thing to do. With what had happened to the Watsons, they decided they would not trade any more guns. When they got home, Gunny was anxious to talk with the security committee, so they called a meeting. Since Jim was one of the potential scout leaders, he joined them. Gunny laid out his plans for two scout squads that would be led at least at first, by Mark and Jim. Each squad would be comprised of five men. Gunny had selected the men he wanted. Susan asked him why no women, 
and she and Gunny had another argument about this subject. 